In this episode of On Two Wheels, we take you from the historic testing grounds of Bavaria to the endless jungles of Thailand. This is the global impact of BMW's GS, four decades in the making. Hey everybody, Zach here, Ari there. Welcome to On Two Wheels. Today, we're talking about the GS. Yeah, and unless you've been living under a rock, you know that's the big adventure bike. It's one of BMW's most important models, and it's a type of motorcycle that's been copied by pretty much every manufacturer. Say BMW's GS models over the years are a river running fast and strong through the countryside. We wanted to get to that bubbly mountain spring, the source, the origin, of the GS, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Never a short answer when a long and complicated one will do. I think what Zach is trying to say is that in order for us to explore the genesis of the GS, we had to go back in time. This is planet Earth in 1980. This is the President of the United States. This is how much gas costs. This is what mainstream motorcycling looked like. And this is what BMW looked like bikes all had street tires, low slung exhaust, and were not meant to get dirty. Then, in 1981, BMW revealed a harebrained idea that would reshape the motorcycling world. Behold! This is that harebrained idea in action. It might not look like much now, but back in the day this bike caused quite the stir. It was weird, controversial, and people were pretty skeptical of its purpose. In fact, if you want to know just how skeptical people were, you need look no further than the October 1980 issue of Motorcycles Magazine. Outrageous. Not just a catchy headline, they really felt that way. Even worse, they thought the bike was barely capable of holding its own. Heavy and awkward. And they complained that it's difficult to feel relaxed or confident flinging this mammoth around. Except that unlike the mammoth, this beast was here to stay. Riding the R80 GS now, it's kind of obvious why some people hated it as an off-road bike. It is a little heavy. It is a little awkward. But that's only when you compare it to a dirt bike. As a street bike, it's something else entirely. It's an idea that no road is off limits and no adventure is too big. An idea that, admittedly, seems a bit outrageous. Of course, hindsight is 2020. but if my predecessors from 1980 thought the idea of riding a 420-pound motorcycle off-road was a little insane, I wonder what they think of the prospect of riding a, I don't know, 600-pound bike in the dirt would be. Don't exaggerate, Aerie. It's 593 pounds with a full eight gallons of fuel, I might add. <laughs> is this a motorcycle you are riding or a small moon? <laughs> I think it splits the difference pretty well, don't you? Well, I think the gravitational pull of your planet's gonna pull me over. Mm -hmm. You smell like burnt oil and wax cotton. Hey, buddy, it's called character, <laughs> not the soulless hunk of metal you're riding. Ugh, soulless? It has the same soul of your very machine, my friend. Well, it makes sense that it carries that. It's carrying all sorts of other stuff. <laughs> Dickhead. Well, you're obviously really proud of that dinosaur. You wanna show me what it can do? Yeah. Yeah, see Listen if you can to keep that. up, youngin. <laughs> uh. That Eric Hemming was just born after his time, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh oh, geez, I need first. Oh, f <laughs> Come on, chug it, chug it, chug it. Yeah! <laughs> Sick. I gotta say, man, this bike is pretty rudimentary. It's built like a hammer and it's about as effective. No frills, nothing fancy, but man, does it work. Yeah, I am pretty impressed, I have to say, with what I'm watching right now. Look at you, Mr. Sophisticated. You're like a satellite with your electronic suspension and your enduro ABS and trash control. Yeah, I know. I am, I'm really just riding the state of the art here. My suspension adjusting 100 times a second. I don't even think my suspension's adjustable. <laughs> it doesn't look like it needs to be, though, judging watching you. It's working really well. I mean, it doesn't have a ton of power. It's not super easy to wheelie, but it's comfortable. It feels pretty light. It feels really well balanced. As I'm riding this thing, I'm reminded very much of what a modern GS feels like. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of salient 
characteristics that feel the same, like the low center of gravity, the super torquey engine. I mean, it's amazing how much has been maintained and yet how much that bike has evolved and changed over the years. And it's also cool to basically verify all that heritage that you could easily dismiss as just, you know, marketing BS. See, the BMW is always on their horse about how, oh, the GS, the original travel enduro and blah, blah, blah. But then you, you know, we're riding these two bikes next to each other and they are clearly related. So when BMW introduced this motorcycle in 1981, it was supposed to be a street bike, it was supposed to be a touring bike, but it was also supposed to be a motorcycle that you could take off-road. And the interesting thing is that the general consensus was that was a bad idea, that was a bad combination. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point, first of all. And second of all, it amazes me that people still today think that this modern GS is a bad idea. I mean, how many letters do we get at the magazine with guys saying like, ADVs are stupid, they're impractical, they don't make sense, I don't get it. And I mean, the fact is, fact, that we rode these two bikes around the wilderness today and we would, either of us, take either bike across the country on freeways and be perfectly comfortable tomorrow. Yeah, I would definitely take that bike and I would take this bike too. I mean, it's 35 years old but it's still super comfortable, super capable, I mean, it's an impressive machine. So I guess if ADV is wrong, we don't want to be right, agreed? <laughs> definitely, <laughs> but if we're gonna do ADV right, there's still one place we gotta go. Yeah, I was wondering if you were gonna bring that up. Let's do it. Well, we made it, man. Proper adventure ride. <sighs> Pure adventure right here. It's a concrete jungle out there, my friend. Mm. I'm going to be bushwhacking through the jungle of Colombia on my way to Terra del Fuego. I'm going south, man. I'm giving my two weeks notice tomorrow. <sighs> two weeks? I'm not even waiting that long. I just need to get some stuff together, maybe bolt up another six or eight fog lights, and I'm right <laughs> behind you, my friend. More lumens, more lumens. More. I mean, the reality is the local coffee shop is as far as some ADV bikes will ever travel, yep. but if we are really going to explore the far-reaching effects of the GS, we're definitely going to need to go somewhere more exotic than this. Mm. I could not agree more. Cue the montage. This is Thailand, home to 67 million people. This is what their king looks like. This is the exchange rate. This is how they get to work. And this is the GS Trophy, the whole reason we're in Thailand. The GS Trophy is an event that BMW puts on every couple of years where they invite GS riders from all over the world to try to qualify and be brought to a faraway land to compete against the best in the world. So this year, guys are riding across Thailand for seven days, they're camping and they're testing their skills and their teamwork the whole time. And that sounded like a pretty good way to soak up the farthest reaches of GS culture. So we asked BMW if we could check it out. They said, why don't you compete? And I said, holy crap, Ugh. holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. Ah! Uh, shit, 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 shit. Ah! Oh, holy f As you can tell, it's a difficult experience to put into words. I mean, how do you describe an event where amateurs are invited to thrash a $20,000 motorcycle just to prove that it's possible? And what do we mean by thrash? Like I said, pretty easy. Well, maybe not easy, especially the third or fourth time you have to pick up that 500 pound bike. Not to mention riding and camping for more than a week. But the challenge and accomplishing it with like-minded riders is in itself the reward. And perhaps that's one reason why the ADV community is so strong. You're bound by the ridiculousness of the activity and at the end, it just wouldn't be as much fun if it wasn't so hard. Fantastic. Extraordinario. Emotional. Estuvo espectacular. My mejor experience. Making things impossible, making things hard. That's what the GS is all about. So I guess that's pretty much it. And yeah, it feels kind of silly to say that's it, considering the size and the scope of this event. But I feel like we found the pinnacle of the impact that the GS has had on the globe. And considering all of this started with an idea that a German engineer had like 40 years ago is unbelievably cool. Just a brisk 22 hours of travel now and I'll be back sitting on a stool next to Ari Henning. See you guys there. 
Thailand jungle GSs. I mean, that was an epic, epic adventure. Yeah, I feel pretty fortunate. I will say, not my first or last adventure probably on a GS. Actually, Ari knows this, but my dad owns a 1981 GS and I've spent a lot of time as a little kid riding on the back and then riding it as a teenager. So the GS to me is a very sentimental bike, but Ari Henning, his first time on one. So I'm curious, what'd you think? You know, I've had the privilege to ride a lot of historic classic motorcycles, Indeed. bikes that were really popular in their day and I get on them and sometimes they feel slow or they don't handle well though <laughs> and they just don't work that well compared to modern bikes. But interestingly, ironically, when my predecessors rode this thing, they didn't really like it, and I do. I think it's awesome, it works so well. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason they didn't like it is because they didn't get it. They didn't understand that by compromising a little bit on the dirt and on the pavement, they were gaining so much in terms of versatility. They'd get this one motorcycle that could do so much. Yeah, it also says a lot about the modern GS when you ride the old one, because you kind of understand where it came from. I mean, they started with an awesome platform, 35 years ago and they spent the better part of four decades refining it. So no wonder the new bike is so good. Yeah, and I mean, people complain about the price of the GS, they complain about the weight, and that's fair, but that's where the list starts and stops. I mean, yeah. beyond that is just tremendous motorcycle. Yeah, it's true. But I do think that it illustrates a bigger point in motorcycling to me, which is that we should not necessarily celebrate, but encourage manufacturers to take risks and build motorcycles that maybe journalists or consumers don't understand because motorcycling as a whole gets more diverse, genres get more broad, and everybody benefits. Not to mention that 35 years down the road, you never know when you will have created a motorcycle that now defines a category. That's deep, Zach. That's yeah. real deep, man. It's my Vader socks. They give me the force. That's probably as cerebral as we want to go for the internet. Yeah. But we hope you enjoyed this history lesson. We hope you have a little more appreciation for not only the GS, but the ADV category as a whole. Yeah, so tell us your GS story below, write a comment, subscribe, obviously, and we will see you next time. All right. <clears throat> Ready, Zach? Spice it up? I don't know. What are we on the fire? Intro. This is conclusion. Uh, Talking about right. motorcycles. Uh, BMWs, we got two of them here. Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm starting to smell. I don't know what it is. I'm feeling pressurized right now. <laughs> Seriously, this one smells a lot more than this one. It's been a hot minute since Ari Henning has been this punchy. And you're one of them. <laughs> oh my god. Just went straight to the socks. Hey, me too. Check them out. Yes, yeah, we're all dark side over here. <laughs> F the alliance. Mm.